So welcome everybody to our Hong Kong video. It's great to have come back and to really be envisioned and excited about what God's doing and what we've seen. So we're just going to, at first, going to ask folks to just summarize some of what the trip was about, why we went and what happened whilst we were there. And then to have a look at some of the goals that we've got on returning to Dundee. Uh, so who'd like to kick off? My understanding of why we were going uh, was in response to the situation that happened in Dundee with the deaths and it came about with the discussion with Hugh and that, so I went across to learn really what Jackie was doing in Hong Kong. So that's, I think initially that was the purpose of the trip, to find out why they were doing what they were doing and the success it had and how they were managing to go about it. For me. Yeah, and that, and that comment from Hugh, where he, uh, he, he really encouraged us to go, was really key in it, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, it was pro probably pivotal in the decision to go, and then it was a chance comment, and then it was in, like, I think he called it, contacted Jackie, and then the opportunity came up. Uh, yeah, but it was in response to that. Owen? Uh, I was really, really excited to be asked to go because um, I just felt that it was a, a unique opportunity really. Um, I felt in the, in the bridge that the Holy Spirit had already been starting to kind of move and to connect with people a little bit and certainly with the team when we were praying in the mornings we would have Holy Spirit encounters and when we had events where we would pray for people and things it was starting to be more engaging with Holy Spirit so I really felt that this would probably move us on from where we were to a different place. I had no idea what that would be or what that would look like, but I really felt it was just an, another step, really. Yeah, and you had some great times of encounters with the Holy Spirit at the bridge, didn't you? Yes, yes, very much so. Certainly in the last two years, I would say, not maybe before that, but it was building up over the last couple of years. And when we had Alphas, um, Holy Spirit would always turn up. If we had a prayer um, session, which was just, random really we'd have it through in the back the holy spirit would turn up and people would, some people gave their life to jesus as a result of that so it was quite exciting and dave you don't work in the bridge context but you are obviously working with the reconnections and recovery at the friary project yeah. what was your goal in heading out to hong kong well i think it first started after a meeting with uh you uh you gifford because in the project, we'd lost six people due to addiction, and obviously they all that died, was of, they all died of overdoses. Overdoses, yeah. Well, one one was actually alcohol. Uh, the the underlying effects of alcoholism. So basically, it was all due to addiction, and because of the statistics in Dundee, which are obviously synonymous with being the highest in the world, drug deaths then obviously it was a no-brainer. When you said to me, have you heard of Jackie Pullinger? I had, but didn't really relate it to me actually going and seeing her. And it was his suggestion to go and see her. So for me, it was, yeah, well, something needs to change, both in the project and in Dundee. And if we can find something by going over to China, to Hong Kong and seeing Jackie and seeing what happens there, then... You know, it's only a gain. I think as well, people were moved by, you know, the, the deaths here and the funerals and everything like that and the grief. And it was a, in response to when they were searching for an answer to address, you know, what can we do about this? And I think that's kind of what prompted the trip in that as well. But the whole trip itself, I felt, was very God-led and it really fell into place once we did get the initial ball rolling. It. Oh, why don't you explain the the kind of the formats of what happened whilst we were there. We arrived uh, in time for a conference, which we thought maybe they had annual conferences, but this was actually, as it turned out, really unusual. And uh, we were there for almost all of the conference, Craig caught all of it and we missed one day. And um, it was amazingly informative and really useful for us because um, it kind of, it, it set out an idea of what you would be doing, why you would be doing it, and let you see the ethos and the drive of the place. And um, uh, Jackie and uh, her um, co-partner, Margaret, Jackie Pullinger and Margaret, were both doing parts of the lectures, along with people who had been 
previously been um, brothers in the houses, who'd previously been addicts of some form or another, um, who had continued and carried on and been become involved themselves with their families in the St Stephen's Society organisation. So um, it was very informative and really interesting. We also met amazing people from all over the place, um, from all over the world, really. And some people had literally just come for that week. As well as lectures, we had um, case studies where we would sit and um, listen to people's stories and uh, the difficulties that they'd had until they encountered Jackie or or other people from St Stephen. One of, one of the highlights for me, I think, was just hearing them talk about enabling culture and how we have practices that enable people to stay in their, uh, you know, in their, in their addiction. Mm -hmm. So we, we support yeah. them rather than uh, help them out of it. I think for me too, Craig, I think that sort of... Um, dawned on me that's partly what we do in the bridge you know we love people and we we're helping them and we're supporting them and we are trying to encourage them to know something about Jesus but at the same time we are enabling in as much as we continue to feed them whether they're interested in Jesus or not we continue to uh, support them whether they want to talk about faith or not you know yeah. there is a lot of enabling goes on in, in the bridge too yeah, I think for me it was a realisation that we're in a position where because we don't see these guys on a regular basis as far as being there constantly, uh, we struggle because when they go home, it's where they're around drugs a lot of the time or alcohol, it's readily available. So we were, we were actually seeing a different side and it kind of gave us a flavour of what it was going to be like uh, when we got into into the house. I thought the environment itself was good in St Stephen's because um, you were, although you were still in Hong Kong and Shatin and that, you were separate from the main area, so you weren't as tempted. You know, you were more sort of coveted, almost you were protected from all the things you could get hold of. So, so all the all the addicts or the people who were being served came together in a in a complex. Uh, which is called Shinmung Springs. Is that right? Did I get that right? Sinmung. Sin, Sinmung. Sinmung. Sinmung Springs. So all, all the addicts came together into, in Sinmung and there were multiple houses there. So the environment that you're talking about, Pam, was a, an enclosed, uh, not, not locked, people could leave when, whenever mm -hmm. they liked, but an en enclosed environment where there were multiple blocks that could cater for uh, a, a, a large number of people being helped as well as the volunteers and so on as well as the sports or and other sorts of facilities um, so that that was that in terms of the creating the environment a lot of that stuff was on the on the complex that has developed just over the last 20 years when Jackie started she was working on the street she was meeting people in the homes inviting people back into her home but that's that's the environment that has now been created and has been developed after 50 years and um, the 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 routine in the society is something that's kind of kingdom orientated and it's sort of, it isn't, it isn't yielding. It's not, there's, they don't have lots of free time. Their time is all taken up from morning to night. They start with breakfast and it's always social. Everyone eats together. It's all about kind of looking out for the person that's next to you and caring about the person. And they have breakfast and then after breakfast, it's um, worship where People, um, they have communion very often. At most days they would have communion, I would say. That's normal. Then they would have worship. So worship and prayer and Bible study and communion are all a very important part of their daily life, which really is an ongoing thing. In terms of the process for an individual who is accessing St. Stephen's for the first time, would somebody like to just run us through that? So uh, the new boy was brought in. Um, in the actual house that we were in which was for men they would come in and they'd go into straight into a room which would have two single beds and usually both beds were being used they were put straight into pajamas and then somebody who was already part of what i would call a team would come in and be on duty for that particular person that come in and Basically, over the period of 24 hours in different shifts, people would sit there and they would pray in tongues for the people that were in the pyjamas, in bed. And uh, it was basically uh, there to, to pray for them and to 
to guide them through the period of getting through their addiction and be, getting clean, basically. So that would work in uh, seven different shifts during the day and night. And most of the shifts were three hours long. The ones that I mainly did and Craig were during the night, which would start from 10 o'clock till half past two, and then from half past two till seven. They were the longest shifts. And, you know, it, it was a really special time. Quite difficult at points, but a special time. And being able to pray in tongues for people actually took a lot of the pressure off because for myself personally, before I, I got to Hong Kong, I was in that way of thinking, can I pray for all this time? You know, praying in tongues. But actually, once you start, the Holy Spirit takes over and he, he, he gives you the, the impetus to, to carry on mm -hmm. and carry on and just do what you need to do to get these guys through it. So it was a very special time. What I think puts it in perspective a little bit, Dave, is if you just kind of think about it, like it's say six people who are all withdrawing, probably from heroin or alcohol, all at the same time. And you see yeah. minimal, minimal effect of that. It's kind of hard to get your head around that. If you had one person withdrawing, it could be difficult yeah. enough. But sometimes there's six people all at the same time, all withdrawing from something. And there's very little evidence of it in, in, in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Praying for tongues was a definite highlight for me as well. It was such a privilege to just be able to be given that opportunity to spend, you know, four hours with somebody praying for them. And, you know, you've been able to get really close to that person, sort of mirroring them, and you got a lot of insight from the Holy Spirit on areas to pray into. And you can, throughout, you know, the days and hours, you could really see a big difference. You could see them getting lighter and stuff being lifted off of them um, as well. It was just amazing to see, but the, the, the best thing for me was just, you know, just so little withdrawal and they were so relaxed and peaceful and they were able to get a good night's sleep. And if they were trying to do that in their own strength, they would have all sorts of horrible withdrawal and stuff like that. And, and Dave touched on it as well, you know, worrying about being able to pray in tongues for all that time. And certainly before I went, I didn't really have time to build up to praying for three and a half or four hours or seven hours in a day. I didn't have time to do that. But the Holy, God says that he'll give you what you need at the time. And I think that that's exactly what happened. Holy Spirit just stepped in and just helped us to do it at the time that we really needed to do it. So it's given me confidence that if there was any time that I needed to pray in tongues for six hours, I would do it because Holy Spirit would be doing it with me. Yeah, I was particularly excited as well about the level of devotion that they had. So they were devoted to each other, but they were devoted to God as well. And, and the fact that every day, twice a day, there'd be times of worship and prayer and study. And many of the guys, the brothers, they called them, many of the brothers would be prophesying, bringing words, sharing a tongue, as well as sort of their own personal quiet time, which took place between breakfast and the first worship time. There was a, a real emphasis on worship. There's an emphasis on being in the presence of God. There's an emphasis on listening to the voice of your father. And if you're, and if you're doing that for anything from 15 minutes to an hour and a half, twice a day, every day of the week, do you know what happens? You start to live in the presence of God and you start to understand you know, more of his love. You start to understand more of what it's like to live in his presence. And that, that to me, really created a, uh, an atmosphere of worship and the consciousness of Jesus that uh, that was very special to me. What was really touching was that they were all brand new Christians. Uh, you know, some of them weren't, but lots of them were. And the readiness just to engage in the whole process and the readiness to just throw their heart into worship was just so exciting really to be part of. And sometimes the worship was incredible in that tiny room with people who are all former addicts, some of them still just recovering, and yet they were throwing themselves into worship. And really the atmosphere in there was just lovely, yeah. amazing. <clears throat> I also think being able to meet uh, guys like Winston, you know, who was in the World 60 at, at, right at the beginning mm -hmm. when, when it all started. And the fact that he was still there coming back, you know, and helping these guys. And I think that was the, the, over, the overriding thing that made me feel that this was something really special. 
you know, somebody that had been there for what, nearly 50 years, you know, and actually started as a, as a boy, you know, in the walled city and was still there as, you know, an older man. Mm-hmm. you know and the dedication of that and and that that's what i felt was a dedication of everybody to actually get this sorted you know for people to to get them out of the the mire that they were in um of addiction and uh to bring them into a family you know and it was a big family you know it wasn't wasn't split up into different sections it was all family and and we've well, I personally felt part of that as well, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were also keen to just for everything that they received, they were very keen to give it back and to yeah. put it back and invest it into everybody else that was there. That was lovely to see. Lovely generosity of spirit, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. What about the low light? I think possibly trying to eat chicken's feet uh, was pretty <laughs> pretty near the bottom for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, having the food all cleaved with bones bones in it was a little bit difficult as well. You know, you look at something and think, hmm, that's lovely, and then you have to pick out all the bones. I found that quite difficult. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I like the food, actually. I quite like the yeah. food. I'm pretty good with chopsticks now as well. Yeah, it's pretty comedic with the, the chopsticks. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I look at chicken wings differently now. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you've got to stab them with a chopstick or you can't pick them up. <laughs> I think uh, towards the end of it, after a few night shifts and a little bit of stress, I got uh, I got quite unwell for a couple of days. So I think that was uh, a, a bit of a low point for me. But I think there were some stresses around, weren't there, Dave? You were talking about, um, you know, the fact that that you know you'd really sense the spiritual attack whilst you were praying through the night mm. with with guys that had been oppre- fairly oppressed and you know you you felt that attack yes. coming against you quite a bit yeah i mean i think you know for the first obviously the first week we were at the conference the second week we we're just getting used to being there and getting used to the the format and the, the system and the rotor that they worked with and obviously, we were pushed right in, I would say, at the deep end, you know, to doing the night shifts. And it wasn't the fact that we didn't want to do them. To be honest, in some ways, it was a pleasure because we were helping one of the leaders out of the house because he'd been uh, doing it rock solid for a month. So it was, it was actually a pleasure in that circumstance. But the spiritual attack was real, you know, and I suppose getting into the last week, was when I'd actually got used to it. So for, for, for maybe a week, I was really get under attack. Even, you know, during the day, because obviously it's the after effects of that, you know. But being able to talk to it, being able to get support from the people around me, helped me to get through it. Yeah, I think we all kind of suffered attack in different ways, really. For me, it was, it was night, night, uh, nightmares when Pam was on night shift. Um, and it's real, and I think it really just shows you the importance of what we're trying to do here, that there is significance and it does have spiritual impact. So I think you've got to kind of expect that there will be some lashback, but it's not something that will stop you. It's just something that's a distraction, that's all. I, I suppose at the end of the day, what, what, what we have to realise is that, you know, we weren't prisoners there. You know, we, we went there of our own choice. and. You know, we had days of rest, we had time to recuperate, we had time to let God give us what we needed, because that was important, actually, not relying on our own strengths, <laughs> because if we'd have done that, then it would have been a real struggle, and uh, we'd have probably wanted to come home pretty quickly. Uh, but we had to 
we are to actually sacrifice and give ourselves to God in that circumstance because he's the only one that could get us through it. I think as well, the times that we took kind of time out while we were there to, to group us a four and pray for each other, and I think that I found that really helpful and supportive. And it just it gave us a chance to pray for one another and nip anything in the bud mm-hmm. before it got out of hand and then mm-hmm. we could carry on with the day more easily. Yeah. And away from me, are sort of highs and lows. Communication, I found, was in a way a blessing because you couldn't under you weren't distracted. So if you're pain in tongues, you weren't distracted. You could focus on it and that, but it had its limitations because obviously you weren't really totally aware of. You could kind of pick up what was happening, but you didn't really know what was being said. So it was it was good, but it was bad. So guys, what do you think uh, God can do in Dundee? Having having seen what we've seen in Hong Kong, what do we think that God can do for uh, for our city and for individuals? Well, I think that God already has a plan. I think he already was starting to move. I think already he's been touching people. I think already Holy Spirit's been rising in people in a different way. And I think, you know, that God sent us there to prepare us. And I hope that other people, when they, when they see this, will be touched by it or feel that it has a meaning for them and that a team will start to grow of people who genuinely feel they have a heart for this. I think that God's going to do something amazing and I think it'll look different than Hong Kong did. God, like you say, is already preparing or has already prepared the plan uh, for what happens in Dundee. But I also think that it's preparing the church as well because this, this can't be done by one church. This has to be the church to, to pull this off. Uh, and we've got enough resources in Dundee and God will give us the resources we need. So, you know, this is not just going to be about city church. This is going to be about churches getting together with one mind and being able to to put those resources together to change the, the environment of Dundee and change the landscape. Yeah, I think as well, well, God's scope is, is unlimited for what he can, can do. You know, what do you think he's going to do? He could, he could do anything, anything he wants. He's already paving the way for what's happening just now. I think he's preparing a new way that communities are coming together and helping each other. And I think that's maybe, you know, how you the inroad in because you're, you're building communities, you are helping each other and people are looking for support and they're looking for God. And technology is being used differently with us today instead of all meeting up. Uh, people are isolated and, you know, they want something new. They want to reach out to God and they want something new in their lives. I think, you know, this is just the start of it. I'm excited for the first person, never mind the first person. I'm also excited for the the 10th person and the 100th person. But I'm excited for the first person that we sit down with and we we pray through to see freedom come to their lives through the the power of Jesus. Mm. And and I think learning about the, the power of praying in tongues and the fact that you can intentionally create an atmosphere where, where the sovereignty of God and the atmosphere of heaven comes into a room and comes into a person's life, to me, is really exciting. It's not just, oh, I hope God will do something. So every, every one of us, uh, you know, we sat and we prayed with drug addicts in tongues. And as we prayed, freedom started to embed and, and yeah. to come into their lives. Yeah. That's no different in Hong Kong compared to Dundee. So, so that, that for me is, is one of the exciting things that I really want to see mm. taking, taking place. I think as well, like, we've went there, we've, we've got the t-shirt, you know, got there. Mm-hmm. And I think if you said to somebody, this is what happened, they might not be- believe you, but we've actually been there and we've seen this work. We know it works, mm-hmm. you know, so we're, we're bringing that back. We've seen it in action and we know it works. And that's what we've just to let people know. People are hungry for this. You know, there's lots of people who are desperate for God and they need God to change their life. And it's just, this is just going to be amazing. It's going to I just, want to, I just want to say as well, you know, I can really feel the Holy Spirit just now while we're talking about this. And I feel that the readiness of Holy Spirit to just jump into every part of this is just amazing me. And I think that when people engage with praying in tongues, with the Bible study, the prayer, the worship, well, any of that, I think Holy Spirit's going to be right alongside them. And that'll be the thing that continues us, gives us momentum and everything. Amazing. Yeah, I think as well, one, one thing that Jackie said 
which really struck me was this is not about addiction. This is about yes. getting people saved yeah. and into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Now that re that really touched me because because my head was going over there about you know getting people free from addiction. She actually turned that on its head and said, "No, this is not about addiction. This is about getting people saved and yeah. free." You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's actually bigger than what we imagined. I think. Well, I know, not not think. Well, addiction, if we're working with addicts, our work is restricted to addicts. If we're working with salvation, our work is restricted to the unsaved. And there's an awful lot more of them than there is yeah. of addicts. And I think yeah. there is some power in that. Yeah. One of, my concerns, sorry, sorry, Pam. one of my concerns for coming back was, you know, how, where is the time going to come from? Where am I going to fit in? And just look, everybody has so much time on their hands now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think this is like preparation time. I think God's given us a bit more time to kind of um, get ourselves into the right place. I think he's obviously just setting things into place for us. I think we've got to just make use of this time. And one thing I'm finding quite difficult is sort of sustaining what we were doing there. Because I'm by myself, I'm finding that a bit difficult. Um, but I am trying to do Bible study and I am trying to pray in tongues more. But it is difficult, incredibly difficult. The minute you're back, things do change. It is difficult to sort of sustain that. So I'm glad that we're all in it. I'm glad that we've all been there, that we all can remind each other of how important it is to, to continue an undiluted version <clears throat> of what we saw. Yeah. And I think it also confirmed for me that residential is the answer. You know, we, we, we've tried other ways. You know, we've tried, you know, the reconnection project and, and that's got its place. Uh, we've we've tried the bridge you know and that's got its place but actually it needs to be residential and that that's that was the the thing that came most out of it you know when i got back it was there was no doubt you know it had to be residential yeah because like jackie said you can't have 50 percent kingdom and 50 percent the world because when they're 50 percent the world they'll do whatever yeah. they like yeah and that's the thing so you know for, for me the devotion um, the devotion to God that we saw in that community uh, and the fact, you know, that it's about salvation, it's not about addiction. So you can't have 50% yeah. world, 50% kingdom. It's all, it's all the yeah. same thing. It's all about one yeah. thing. And actually, it's all about one person, and that's, that's Jesus and how he sets us free. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I just say that you don't have to have been in Hong Kong or in St. Stephen's to be able to... Um, to get this because I think once people start, once people are involved, they'll realize the power of it and they'll realize how much Holy Spirit touches them as they're involved in it themselves, as they engage in this process. You don't have to have been in Hong Kong to do this. But Holy Spirit's well, everywhere. Yeah. God's everywhere. I, I think God, well, I, I know, to be honest, that God chose us to go there you know, to bring this message back. So, you know, we, we, we went there, we, we did the, the four weeks, and now we've come back and we've, we're bringing the message back from there. So, you know, he, we trust in him and he trusts us to bring that message back. Very good. Okay. Thanks, yeah. guys. You're all amazing. Love you. We'll see you, you, uh, you, we'll too. See you soon. Love you. Bye. God bless. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.